Welcome to the special first ever addendum episode of Lost Subscribed, where we have a special call, special caller, Jim Hart, trademark lawyer, and just otherwise entrepreneur, content creator, extraordinaire lawyer, who is for the first time ever amending his answer to is a hot dog a sandwich. So Jim, take it away. All right. Full disclosure here, I don't recall what my first answer was. So I don't know what I said back then. However, I will respond to that question with a question. And let me ask you, so if you were to go out and take a single slice of bread and stick it on your, your counter on a plate, if you're a heathen and put it directly on the counter, I know people that do that. I think that's disgusting. Anyway, and you put a slice of bread down and you're like, I want to make, you know, a turkey sandwich. And so you put your mayonnaise down, you put your mustard down, you put some turkey on it. If you take that, that thing, now viewers can't see this, but if you take that bread and you roll it around the turkey, is that a sandwich to you? You're asking me a question? I'm asking you, would that be a sandwich? I'm, I'll am i answer, but first I need to know from you. What do okay, you think? Okay, fine. I'm going to say that's not a sandwich because that doesn't have two pieces of bread. But that's not my rationale for why a hot dog is not a sandwich. That's That's more akin to a hot dog than it is to a turkey sandwich, in my opinion, because you're wrapping the bread around the meat or the whatever you veggies or whatever you put in your sandwich um the 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 key to this is that when you eat a sandwich you eat it now again people can't see this but you eat it like this like you you pick it up and you've got the bread on the top and the bread on the bottom and the the sandwich stuff in between and you eat it sideways when you pick up a hot dog or a veggie dog as my kids would say it's you pick it up sideways. Who eats a sandwich sideways? Nobody eats a sandwich sideways. If, if you took a, a turkey sandwich and tried to eat it with the bread on the left and the right, as opposed to on the top of the bottom, you're not eating a sandwich. That, that would be what you're eating with the hot dog. And with the hot dog, the sandwich is on the left and the right, or the bread is on the left and the right, not on the top and the bottom. Now, I don't know, maybe some people eat a hot dog the other way, but I think most people you know, you don't pick it up long ways and take a bite out of the middle of the hot dog. You eat it like that. That's my point. So I say, no, it's not a sandwich. <laughs> All right. Well, while you were giving that very detailed and, and well thought out explanation, I did pull up the transcript from your last answer. Oh, God. And so we'll read it into the record if we'll stick with the legal theme here. Okay. So with all that being said, Jim, my last question for you is a question I ask all my guests, which is, is a hot dog a sandwich and why? Answers Jim, it's a hot of, of course. Yes, of course it is. Yes, it's a sandwich. Why? Because it's <laughs> it's food between two bun, two, two pieces of bun. <laughs> so I've reversed. I've done a 180. <laughs> Absolutely not. And I've thought about this a lot because I've listened to a lot of your episodes and I think about it every time and I want to scream at people that say that it's a sandwich. Okay, no. okay. Now, because you asked me, would I consider that a sandwich? Well, first of all, let me say that in, in, if you give a kid a hot dog and you don't eat it first and it's the first hot dog they've ever had, you mm -hmm. don't know how they're going to eat that hot dog and they might eat it from the center, right? So like some of this is about constraints that we place on ourselves, functional fixedness of like looking at how other people do things, right? So that's that's caveat number one. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, please. No, no, you go. No, go ahead. Okay. Okay. And, and you know, it, it largely depends on the bun, right? Is the bun separated? Because in, I don't know how you buy buns, Jim, but when I buy buns, they're actually connected. It's one piece of bread. It's not two pieces of bread. Right. And there's, there's not just one piece of bread that's sliced down the middle on the top, especially if you're in New York and you go to a Yankees game. That's how they do it. Right. One. So I'm thinking more because a lot of people say two pieces, like even when you said two pieces. Right. And you concluded sandwich. I'm thinking one piece. So it's not left and right oh, coverage. Yeah. It's left, right and bottom coverage. Right. So yeah. It's, it's, like it's wrapped. Right. So, so, you know, a taco is another sort of classic example. Right. A taco. A sandwich. Even like what happens when you take a piece of pizza talking about New York. And you, you take a big slice, like, like ooey gooey slice of pizza and you fold it over and you take a bite, right? Also bread. That's three closer sides. to a hot dog than that is to a sandwich. Right. So uh, you're now, now, now you're starting to see my logic. Okay, good, good, good. So what is an open-faced sandwich? If not a sandwich with one piece of bread, right? It's so, not a sandwich. 
I, it's called it's got sandwich in the name, open faced sandwich. Okay. So, so when I was in Portugal, there is a meal you can Google this. It's called a Francis, Francis. I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher the name, Francesinha. Mm -hmm. It's spelled F R A N C E S I N H A, I think, Francesinha. And it is quote unquote a sandwich. And what they do is they take a slice of bread, they put it on a plate, they put a ton of meat, like every kind of meat you could possibly imagine, they put on. They put cheese on it. They put another slice of uh, bread. They put more cheese. They bake it in an oven. And then they dump a ton of gravy on top of it. And when you get it, and I think they actually melt more cheese on top. It's like a heart attack waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and when you get it, you eat it with a knife and a fork. Is that a sandwich? I eat pizza with a knife and a fork, a deep dish pizza. Is that still pizza? Well, deep dish pizza isn't pizza, so like that's that's a different. I don't know. It's a literally ask John the name. I mean, that's like a, it's a casserole. It it's it's <laughs> in the name. It's in the name. It's a part of the naming convention. I'm just saying that Occam's razor, you know, like the simplest solution is probably the right one, right? Um, and so, an open face sandwich is a sandwich. A deep dish pizza is a pizza. It's literally in the name, right? If you have to use a modifier before the sandwich, it's not a sandwich. And also, a hot dog is not called a sandwich. It's called a hot dog. Is a human just a brain? Or is it the body that encompasses it as well? All right. I, wait, hold on one second. My son is a little sick, so he's home from school day. Let's get the, let's get the innocent perspective from a nine-year-old. Okay. This, this is good. Have you ever asked a child? My daughter, but she's only three. And so her, her context is limited. If you don't want to be on video, can, can Matt, can you hear him? Okay. Okay. Just get a little bit closer. You could say off camera, just get a little bit closer to your dad. Go over here. Go over here. Because the camera, the microphone's right there. All right. So this is very important legal stuff. No, I'm just kidding. It's not. The question is, is a hot dog a sandwich? No, it's a hot dog. That's as innocent as you can get. <laughs> All right. You're good. Thank Thanks. you. There you go. It's a hot dog. <laughs> You don't even need to ask is, anybody. Is, is a sandal a shoe or is it a sandal? All right. So <laughs> I'm just saying that there are a lot of things that look very different or operate a little differently, but contextually, when you look at it from the forest perspective, the macro perspective, if you will, still applicable. Well, I think if you're looking at it from a scientific perspective, you know, and you've got like we're all originated from like a single cellular organism. So as you branch down, you've got different branches of things. You know, technically I would say the hot dog is probably in the, you know, the, family the, of the whatever genius. includes sandwiches and hot dogs. They're probably in the same, they're probably like close cousins, but they're not, doesn't mean they're the same. You know, we're cousins to apes, but an ape is not a human being. No, but we're sapiens. Yes. We are. And so I'm just saying that I would say like, I think, I think an ape to human is, is a good analogy because we also have a common ancestor with the whales and the bats, right? Now we are closer to whales and bats than whales and bats are to each other, but that is far, th that is so far removed. And I think because it much more closely, like a human and an and ape much more closely resemble each other in physical appearance and actions and a lot of things, right? Then and macaques in particular, I think hot dog looks a heck of a lot more like a sandwich than say a taco does because it's a hard shell. You know what I'm saying? So you you are in the camp that a hot dog is a sandwich. It's an open faced sandwich, isn't it obvious? It's just folded over, just like you said. And by I the think, way, pizza think... pizza also an open faced sandwich, and you can't have meat on a pizza, and I often do. And so pizza and a hot dog, both open faced sandwiches. I think it's. I think it's pretty obvious. I think John Stewart got it right when he said y y they call it an, a, a deep dish pizza. You know what they call it in New York? They call it a pizza. <laughs> it's I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I would also call a deep dish pizza a pizza casserole. But you've got all the same ingredients of a pizza. It's just the presentation of it is a little bit different. Same thing is true of different. a hot dog. A little bit different. Same thing no, is true I, of a hot dog. You know.
I think it's a, I think it's an age old question. I think people will be debating this for years and years to come, thanks to your podcast. So it's a <laughs> definite you. conversation starter. Next time I go to a family event, I'm going to ask somebody, and we're going to talk a lot about it. I I think that context definitely matters, right? So like obviously it depends is the true answer, but but my favorite answer so far is actually from Paxton, which is like it's a legal question. Oh, oh yeah. Did and you, so like that's Paxton itself. Well, well, well. When I had uh, Tungi Chow, their founder, on. He said you could actually ask Paxton, like, and it depends on the jurisdiction. Different jurisdictions have different legal answers to <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich or not, because there's actual in certain jurisdictions it matters for like tax and other legal reasons. Yeah. No, there's right? legal there's legal ramifications. All right. That that's yeah, no, I I get that. That and that's anyway. Let's talk about subscriptions. Let's talk okay. about I think I I understand now why you put this question at the end of your episode, because otherwise it would be the entire episode every single time. You'd be the is the hot dog a sandwich podcast and not the law subscribe podcast. That that that's right. Although I am thinking about branching out into multiple different types of types of themed episodes, if you will. I don't think I'm gonna do the hot dog is a hot dog a sandwich theme, but I I'm in the process of figuring out how to do two different types of podcasts on top of my current one. The first one is going to be more focused on just the lawyers like yourself. Mm -hmm. The other one is going to be focused more on legal tech. And then it's going to, then the other one is going to be subscription therapy, which is like where people have, people have, well, I'm not going to really record any more or less than I'm already recording. It's just, I'm going to be able to better categorize it for for listeners. How many recordings do you do a week? You publish what, once a week? Oh yeah, once a week, it ebbs and flows. So right now I have I have uh, mainline episodes recorded through 99. And I think published at the time of recording is only 67 launches tomorrow. You've got like, episodes you've got like seven or eight months in the hopper right now. Totally, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. And so it, John it's Lee Dumas would love you. What'd you say? John Lee Dumas would love you. I don't know who that is. You don't know who that is? No. It might be before your time. He started Entrepreneur on Fire. It was the first ever daily podcast. And his big thing was he did, he recorded like and edited like, he did, he batched them all on Monday. He did like eight recordings a, a week on Monday. And his goal was to get like three or four months ahead of schedule. And he did a daily podcast. And he says that's how he's able to do a daily podcast because he worked really hard push it up so that he had, you know, four months in advance scheduled. Yeah. Um, and that was his big thing. Yeah. You, you got to pick an, so like, I don't want to do daily because that means I have to like record oh. once a week, right? Like, like if you're doing like news coverage or other types of things, like you can't do what I do. My topics are evergreen is a yeah. hot dog, a sandwich, <laughs> you know, but like if, if, even if legal services, even if the, the U in the U S the billable hour were banned tomorrow, there would still be a transition period that would probably be granted and an a, a, an a adoption curve of like how people are doing it. So even my episodes I've already recorded that won't be published till the end of 2024, I think would still be relevant at the time of publication. And so like if you pick an evergreen topic, you could do this type of advanced recording. The the thing that I'll, I'll like I'll happily if a if a guest is like well I am a book's about to release or something's about to come out I'll bump them up the publication schedule like it's not a big deal I'm happy to coordinate with guests but but because the topic is evergreen I'm able to batch you know record I mean it's not really batch recording I do more batch editing because I just record whenever people are available and then I'll spend like a Saturday or a Sunday editing the stuff and I'll edit a lot in advance and now that I've just I've just I have the same exact intro, ad spot, and outro in all of them. I, I, it has significantly reduced the editing time because realistically, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I skip that stuff. Longtime listeners skip it, but I, I, I still include it because it might be somebody's first episode. Yeah. yeah. And so, so I'm like, you know, why am I going to do an intro, a unique intro every time introducing the guest? They're just going to skip to it and get to the meat of it because that's what I do. And I listen to a lot of podcasts. So, so I've stopped doing custom intros. And, and that has significantly reduced the edit time, thankfully. And, and Descript lets you save templates, although it doesn't work exactly like I want it to work. So I'm still doing a little bit of copying and pasting. And because I'm so far in advance, like I'm able to strategize around splitting up the show into three different versions. Mm-hmm. And, and, and as I take on more subscription seminar, like 
whatever we want to call them. Clients, um, yeah. Cl yeah, clients, I guess. Like lawyers who wanted me to teach them how to do it, which I can't, I don't have a lot of time for, but although I'm going to get more time once I'm done producing the podcast through the year, I may even spin that off into its own. Like if I, if they want that stuff, some of that stuff to be public and shared to inspire others, that might even be a fourth branch of Law Subscribed. But I have time to do that now because I'm so far in advance, but also I'm able to do the Law for Kids podcast, which is another thing that I'm doing, which I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to it yet. Hold on. Where's my OBS? This is my background for that. The Law for oh. Kids podcast. Let's see. So, so this is one minute bite-sized episodes about legal concepts for kids. At the time of recording, the first episode is live. They go live every Monday. I recorded with my kid so I could pay my kid and take the applicable deduction according to my CPA yeah. by, by, by paying my kid and just, and, and I'm not, you know, like I'm just paying her and like putting into a savings account for her, you know, sure. probably a CD, right? So nothing too fancy, but, but I'm, I'm able to work with my kid. She's doing voiceover. She loves being in daddy's recording booth. And I'm, I, and I, you just batch record because I'm, I do like 10 episodes at a time because it's only, I could only speak. I have an intro and a short, I have like a five second, 10 second intro and like a three second outro. So I only have like 45 to 50 seconds of talking oh, about yeah. a legal topic. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to do. I batch record it. Editing it is a little difficult because like, how do you figure out all the right words? Like, can I take out a that, you know, and it still makes sense because I'm trying to make it fit into YouTube shorts and TikTok and Instagram and everywhere, but I'm also publishing it literally as a one minute podcast, right? So it's why it's called the Law for Kids podcast. And am I going to get any clients from it? I mean, I don't know. It would be nice if over time I built some good brand affinity with, you know, hey, he's doing good educational things for, for kids. Um, but the idea is, you know, parents share it with their kids. Educators use it as jumping off points to talk about it in class, you know, whatever sort of situation, right? And, and they'll just people will come to know Matthew Curvis, right? And that's, that's the, and if, if they don't, then nobody saw it anyway and it's okay, right? Like people are scared of creating content, but because I'm so far ahead and law subscribed, I've been able to launch this project, which I've been thinking about for several months. Wow. Well, good for you. I mean, you know, what's interesting is, as you mentioned, like, I don't know if you'll get clients from it, blah, blah, blah. When I did my YouTube channel, when I started my YouTube channel, I like, there was a video at some point, like something went by, like he was, it was kind of chugging along and getting a few video hits a day. And then I went and went and there was a spike in views. And I was like, what happened? And I did a little bit of research. It was really hard to figure out what happened or where it happened, but it had to, it was an educational institution. It was like a university, like some economics professor caught on to something that I was doing or some, you know, pre-law professor caught on to what I was doing. And must have shared it with their class who then wow. shared it with other people and that's how and and that's where yeah that's that's what happened so you never know you never know what gets picked, gets picked up yeah but, but like you and i will say you know i don't know exactly how i came up with the idea but i'm sure what you're doing with content creation probably played a role in my subconscious right as, as of what a lawyer's doing so jim you had a role in the law for kids podcast in the genesis of it i'm sure but you're still a practicing lawyer and that's the primary thing. You're not trying to be Jim Hart, the content creator, although you are one. No, and not that's, that. And I'm following that similar path. I don't want to be Matthew Kerbis, the content creator, law for kids guy. I'm just trying to put out some good out there, some educational content. And I still want to be Matthew Kerbis, the subscription attorney, practicing lawyer. Like that's not, th that's my goal is to keep practicing law. I think, I mean, I think the subscription attorney, I mean, I think it's great. I think you've carved out a niche for yourself and you're the one that's kind of doing this and leading the charge. And I think, I think that's, that's fantastic. And I think that's where you should really focus. We've got, we've got a hound and he literally will not shut up. Like, unless somebody else comes to get him and tells him to shut up. And even then he has a hard time. The Bo? His name is Bo. Yeah. Oh, Bo, Bo. Okay. Bo, Bo. Yeah. We named him after Barack Obama. So that was the, that was the genesis for that. Biden didn't quite have the same ring to it. So um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. So yeah, a lot's happened with me since I've been back in the States and things have changed quite a bit. And, and I, I, I did incorporate a little bit after we talked of a subscription into my law firm and I've got, 
uh, a handful of people that joined under, it's a, basically a, about $100 a month level. I have some people who are paying as much as $300 a month. I don't know where we're going to go with that. I think we're, we're going to have to see. Time will tell. The trademark stuff is still majority of what I do. But, and I've, but I've started taking on some bigger projects that I'm trying. So I work with, I hired Whitney. You have Whitney on your podcast, Whitney Harper. Harper. Yeah. yeah. And so basically she put out like a little program, a subscription coaching program where she does monthly calls with us and kind of is teaching us how she's doing her subscriptions, which is like with this point system. And as opposed to the billable hour, you're billing by the point and one point is worth, you know, a set amount of money. And so that's kind of how we're doing it. So we're outlining a project and saying, how much is this project going to cost in terms of points? And then if people want to purchase more projects, like more points, they get a discount and then we can build them on a monthly basis. So it's kind of a quasi subscription, but it's not a, like a long-term, like evergreen type of thing. They hire us for, you know, three months at a time. And I have yet to have anybody actually do that. Most people are still hiring me on like a project basis because I think they, they understand a project. They understand if they pay X amount of money, they're going to get X, Y deliverable. Right. Uh, but the idea of having this open-ended, oh, I'm going to pay you, you know, a lot more money each month to do all my legal work is kind of, I think, to some people still a little bit scary. Also, I think some of my clients are not at that level where they necessarily need that amount of work. So yeah, so a lot of a lot has changed since last we talked. Last we talked, I don't think, like I was trying to figure out if subscriptions would even work for me. And so basically I took all my COVID membership students and I just said, okay, you're all now law firm clients. So that's what we're going to do. And so that's what we did. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, cause you were using the subscription. It's just, we were using it for the, the other business, right? Non-legal the, stuff. Yeah. And I said, I couldn't give you legal advice. And so basically what I did is I made them all law firm clients and said, okay, well now I can give you legal advice, but I need to talk with you. I need to get more. I need to know more about your situation. I need to do this. So if you want legal advice, you need to schedule a call with me and we can talk about what you're doing. So it's kind of, that's the way I'm doing it now. And I just had somebody sign up today. I just got an email from a notification on my phone that somebody just hired us today to do that. So yeah, it's working. I mean, yeah, long-term it's harder. I mean, long-term it's probably easier, but it's it takes longer to ramp up. Once you've ramped up, you're good, but it takes a while to get there. Yeah. I mean, classic flywheel, right? You got to keep building the flywheel and get it moving. And, you know, once you get momentum, it's just going to be easier to keep that momentum going. You know, I, I've definitely had some subscribers who have unsubscribed, you know, over the last couple of years that I've been doing this. Cause like, like I talk about it all the time, like because of the podcast and I do a lot of speaking engagements, but like at the end of the day, I've only been doing it, doing it for two years, you know, yeah. before that it was all theory. <laughs> it was all hypotheticals. But I've had, even with like churned clients, they've come back because it's really easy. And if you have a, an accessible price point, whatever that is, 20 bucks, 100 bucks a month, whatever it is, you know, they'll like, I let them unsubscribe and resubscribe is my opinion, because first of all, they probably, you know, happy consumer will come back and consume again, but also they still think of you as their lawyer, even when there's no actual engagement. Yeah. Yep. Um, That's right. And they'd rather come, you know, so let them come back to you, let them leave and come back to you because they're not going to go to anybody else. And at least at, at this stage in the game, there's so few lawyers doing it that way. Mm -hmm. They can't go hire another lawyer doing, you know, doing it like that. Yeah. Even if they, even if they wanted to. The, you know, interesting you, you mentioned that. So that's an issue that I'm running into. Not, not the, not the, they leave and they come back type of issue, but the I really want to make it easy for people to subscribe and unsubscribe. And I don't like the idea that they have to email me and say, I mean, because you're right, it's a pain. And I, I know when I've got subscriptions, if it's like you need to email customer service to, you know, ask to be on. It's like, God, I'm just going to let the charge come through into a charge. Like, I'd rather do that than, you know, than than deal with calling a customer service person and get on the phone and have to hold and do all these things. So I really want to make it easy for people to do that. And Kajabi, which is the software that I've been using to host all my courses, does that. 
but that's all under the guise of my like my other business and it's not under the guise of my law firm and so i'm trying to find a solution that will basically allow people to do that and i'm not i haven't figured i know you use i forget the name of the program you use but i remember i know that does it but i don't want to switch to another software i use clio clio obviously doesn't do that maybe kimberly bennett's program does i'm not sure yeah, so that, I, that's i don't that's know the thing i'm struggling with yeah it's it's a good question for them you'd think they would at least give you the option to turn that on and let clients unsubscribe on their own because sweet dash lets you do that like i could turn it on or turn it off yeah. i did learn that while i had turned it on that clients can unsubscribe like I, I had turned off some other feature that lets them see where that is to unsubscribe. This was very early on in my practice. And so I thought I was letting them do it, but I was getting all these emails when they're like, hey, I think I might wanna unsubscribe. How do I do that? And it was good for me because I was also able to then have another touch point with them where like maybe I was able to help them with something and they didn't unsubscribe. But, but for the ones that did, like it was just creating more work for me, like you said, and I didn't like that. So I found that I actually went through with like a client who like was not trying to churn and went in on their profile, which you could also do like in Sweet Dash, you could like view it as the client. Um, but I actually wanted to see it like actually from their point of view, not just like a, a mimicked thing, just to mm -hmm. confirm. And so I, I played around with the settings and I was able to reactivate like that menu on the side that actually let them see the place where they could go and subscribe. And since then, I've had just a handful of unsubscri uh, unsubscribers because people like it. I mean, for 20 bucks a month, it's like, I mean, you might as well stay subscribed if you have a legal question. Um, yeah. so, so I don't have a lot of churn, but, but for the churn that I've had, they've been able to do it themselves. I've only had one person since I turned that back on who like couldn't find the unsubscribe. Yeah. The, so a couple of the solutions that I've thought about or, or looked into are, I think it was Chris used to be John Tobin, Chris Baldheims. Is yeah. that right? I think he, he uses, I think he mentioned to me, he uses Recurly maybe. And I yes. looked into Recurly, which would be a good solution, except if you read their fine print, it's free for 12 months. And then it bumps up to like $250 a month. And I'm like, well, I don't, I mean, that's, I mean, that's like enterprise level. I don't want to pay $250 a month just to let people unsubscribe whenever they want. And once you pick one of these softwares, you're probably going to be with them for a while. So it's almost like a marriage. You don't want to pick something that is going to do something like that. So I looked at them. I mean, I guess the other option would be, I don't think I use Thrivecart for my checkout, which is great. I don't know if you've ever looked into Thrivecart, but it's nice because you pay one fee. And as of right now, they have not started asking people to pay a monthly fee on top of that. It's just the one fee. That's it. I don't know that it offers that type of service and so everything still goes through stripe and and i think you can do it with stripe the problem there is again they want you to upgrade to a different plan that's cost more money each month which i haven't been willing to do just yet so yeah, i'm just that's I'm just why for options. i haven't that's figured why, yeah that, that's why you would use a third-party solution to integrate with stripe to do it because yeah. i know stripe can be more costly and also if you really want to leverage stripe like you have to have a, you have to know how to code or, or like have a coder on, on, you know, your team. And I just, I'm not willing to do that either. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. If you're not going through a third party software. So, I mean, then the other option I think would be, oh shoot. Uh, I just said it on top of my tongue. Now I forget. Well, Confido Probably. Legal, which used to be Gravity Legal. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Gravity Legal. Yeah. Yeah. So now they're Confido. They let you power subscriptions and it doesn't cost you anything other than the, you know, 2.95% because mm -hmm. they don't do the 30 cents per transaction. So they they have additional 0.05% that they do charge for credit cards and debit cards. But I don't know. And if I was starting over from scratch, frankly, I would just set up my subscriptions through them and keep it separate from my practice management because mm -hmm. I love to tinker and I want to maybe try new things. And I think there's value in having that payments that you're getting separate from your practice management system. So then you, you don't have unintentional churn when you're switching clients over to a new system. Um, yeah. but, but that is a good question is, can they unsubscribe? Can clients unsubscribe on their own through a confidal legal? And I don't know. It's a good yeah, question. Yeah, because I have an account with them. I haven't used it yet. Like I went through their application process and got approved and everything, but I haven't used it for anything as of yet. And so I'm just looking for that solution. I, I And there's not, 
I mean, other than maybe Recurly or Sweet Dash, it sounds like does it. I I don't know. I don't have an I wish there was so if somebody is listening to this, please come up with a solution for lawyers to let their clients do a subscription and then auto unsubscribe because that and, would be a huge value. And frankly, let them also subscribe at higher tiers or lower tiers on their own self-service because yeah. I also need that solution because that solution does not exist for lawyers. Like if I, there, there's, what's it called? It's called, hold on, I'll tell you in a second. It's called, so hold on a second. I'm pulling up, I'm pulling up Slack because I'm in their Slack group. I haven't actually used them yet, but I know they let you do all of this stuff that we're talking about. It's not built for lawyers. It's just client portal solution software, but it is expensive in that they take an additional percentage than Stripe on top of it if you want to do subscriptions. And it's like not insignificant. And I, I'm not charging enough. Now I could charge more. It's called Copilot. There's um, client portal software called Copilot where you could do all of the things we're talking about, Jim, but mm -hmm. we would have to give up a higher percentage of what we're charging our clients. Yeah. Which just means that's typically to, the issue. Yeah. I, so charge I guess more. It, it really, for me, I guess the, the, the issue for me is right now where I'm at, I don't know that I have enough subscriptions to to justify like for Recurly a $250 fee um, a month plan or for something else where I'm giving up a higher percentage of the amount. I guess at some point, you know, if you get to, you know, and I'm not there yet, 5,000, 10,000, $20,000 a month in subscriptions, then yeah, a $250 a month solution for that probably makes sense. But then again, like you said, you have to go through the process of transitioning everything over, you know, potentially you get some churn from clients that don't update their information. So there's could be issues there. So it's a very, and I think that's probably why Recurly offers 12 months free because their hope is you'll build your subscription up to, you know, 10,000, 20,000 a month, and then you won't even notice the fee because it'll just be there. So I don't know. Yeah. And, and look, looking here at like the prices for Copilot, like at first it's like, it's not bad. So it's 29 bucks a month to get started, but it doesn't let you do a custom website and custom domain. And it doesn't let you use Zapier if you want to connect a bunch of things to it or make. And, and so if you want the custom domain, which I would want portal.subscriptionattorney.com, sure. it's $69 a month for the annual plan which is higher, but still cheaper than like your Fidu at 99 a month and, and some of these other more affordable client portal solutions. But then when you actually go into it and look at like the cost for transactions, they take an additional percentage on subscriptions if you have subscribers in their platform. And if they didn't do that, I would be a customer because I love the look. It's beautifully designed. Mm -hmm. It's got all the features I need, but they're taking additional money from me from my subscribers and i don't want to do that and i've talked to them about that and this is not copilot microsoft copilot no this is copilot.com how about that for a domain huh how about yeah. that yeah no yeah so the let me just look yeah so 29 dollars a month so you would want to go up to the professional plan and and you said it's you said they do charge. Oh, there it is. Credit card. Yeah. 3.2%. Like that's a lot. Like right now I'm, I mean, it doesn't seem like a lot, but you know, it, it, it and, and, and on the starter plan it's 3.5%. So in addition to, they add another, it looks like 2% for, oh, recurring subscription. They add another half a percent. That's what I'm talking about. I know. Yeah. So you're paying 3.7%. So, I mean, I guess you have to ask yourself, you know, does it make sense to pay a little bit higher percentage to have this benefit? I will tell you, Kajabi does it. Like Kajabi offers a one, a one click um, unsubscribe, but you have to pay, you know, two or $300 a month or whatever it is for their platform, which is interesting because I talked to Chris Valdimes about this. And I'm like, why are you using Kajabi? Because he has Kajabi as his backend. He's like, well, I'm using it as his, as his sales pages. And I'm like, well, that's great. That's just a really expensive sales, what, I'm, what am I saying? Web page designer type of thing. Because they offer everything. They got an email list in there. They do payment processing. They do memberships. They do subscriptions. They do the whole thing. 
And it's all, they don't charge you anything extra for all that. It's all included. So it's actually a really great option. The problem for me is that I would have to, I guess, figure out a way to sell my courses in a different platform. Not that I'm getting that many people buying them anyway, but. Right. I mean, for, like I would, the way that I would adapt it is I would just charge more money. The problem with that is I've tried charging more and I'm, I'm, I'm getting the most interest at my $20 a month. No. Uh -huh. And of then, course. I, of course, right? And 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 so, you know, and and for the clients that are paying me like a thousand or more a month, I'm that then you know it's just simple math, right? It's like I, I'm giving up so much more then. So, so, so I ahead. could just yeah. So I, I I mean I guess I could just get more clients and then it like doesn't really matter. But I'm not there yet. But the business thing to do would be just charge a little bit more money to make up the difference. I just don't. The way I've positioned myself in the market, I can't really raise my prices. So, well, that that's that's a mindset issue. I'm not I'm not no 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 the coaching it, here, but that is a mindset issue. I I have the mindset of I could charge more, but that's literally every other lawyer's mindset, Jim. So I pivot. I pivot. I'm I'm I, I I'm, get it. I'm intentionally zagging when the other lawyers are zigging. I'm, I'm no, but when you when you make a comment that I can't raise my prices, that that is a you oh. can anybody can. Oh, I, I can't, I can't, but then all the, then I the mission of my you. firm, the mission of my firm is to afford, is to be the most affordable lawyer and accessible to people who can't afford other lawyers. So and, I, and I is, can, but I would have to change my mission. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fine. So you choose not to, because it's not in alignment with what you are trying to build. That's exactly. a different, yeah. So yes. No, yeah. Okay. So I'm glad you clarified that. No, the, what I was going to ask you was, have you done an analysis? And so this is what I do. I, I actually, for every client that comes in, a subscription client that comes in, we track when they joined, we track how much they've paid us, we track what additional services they have purchased. So, so what is their true long-term value? And then I, I've started to track and it goes up each month because each month, you know, all these subscriptions renew. And so the long-term value of a customer, whereas it might've started at like a thousand dollars, it ultimately, you know, now it's up to you know, two or $3,000. So, and I don't know the exact, I'm just kind of using that as an example. Those are not right. my actual numbers. But so my question to you is, have you tracked, do you know, like, okay, these people that come in at $20 or $25 a month, what is their long-term value as opposed to the people that come in at a hundred dollars a month? You know, what is their long-term value and long-term customer value? Yeah. And, I I, I, I know, actually, I have answers to that. I have, I have spreadsheets that like calculate all these things. Okay. Um, of course you do. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, and I do it for myself, but that's also one of the things that, you know, I help my subscription seminar folks with, you know, I just, cause I have all that stuff built. So, so I could tell you over the lifetime, like if I have this firm for 30 years, a $20 a month subscriber is probably worth around $10,000 to me over the course of 30 years. That's what they're worth because also they're there, which, which frankly is more than they would pay any other lawyer ever mm -hmm. if they could avoid it. But they're going to pay me that because they're going to have things that come up over that time. And that's not just, they only pay me $20 a month. It's that they're paying me for per, per page pricing along the way. Right. So over the course, and, and that's a rough estimate because who knows, I'm only two years into this. I'm projecting on, I'm making a lot of assumptions, Jim. Yeah. But, but a twenty dollar month subscriber to me over the, over thirty years is worth about ten thousand dollars. I, I okay. I'm gonna challenge you a little bit, and I don't have any problem with that. I understand your numbers. I just ran the quick number: twenty dollars a month times twelve times ten times thirty years is seventy two hundred dollars. You assume some cost of living increases, things like that. So yeah, I, I totally get that. They may hire you from other things, and that's if you just keep your price at twenty dollars a month. If right. you bump to twenty five dollars a month, I mean, you're adding probably you know, maybe they're $15,000 over then, 30 years. But then I can't have 1999 listed pricing, which is- You have 2999. <laughs> like What's the saying, difference? There's something about it's not <laughs> even $20 in the psychology of a person that, you know, and and because not a lot of things happen. They might have one or two real estate transactions. They might have one or two job changes. And like, that's where the other two to $3,000 come in, right? For me, that, that I'll make off that client in 30 years. Because- and, and that's also assuming there's not a mind shift with how people work with lawyers. If I can get people to work with lawyers more, they're actually worth twice as much to me. Yeah. I just need to get them. And, and so I'm, 
I, I'm, that's me, a conservative estimate is the ten thousand dollars, right? Yeah. But if I get, if I get them working with me more and more, and and I do have a conversion, so some people, I help them start a business, and now the twenty dollars a month goes to three hundred a month because now they're a sure. solopreneur. Sure. Right. And then if yeah. they grow and they start hiring, none. This hasn't happened yet, but I imagine if their business is such that they want to grow, they're going to bump up to paying me even more, right? Yeah. As their business grows. So, so the so arguably a twenty dollar a month subscriber who's also entrepreneurial is worth a hundred thousand plus to me over the course of 30 years. Yeah, I, I think I think my problem with that that analysis is the time horizon. You know, I think, I mean, a lot can happen in 30 years, right? I mean, I mean, not just with you personally or me personally, you know, but with, you know, uh, technology, with legal services. I, I, I feel like that is just, I mean, $10,000 over 30 years to me, it's just too long. It's like I was talking to a client yesterday about their YouTube channel, and they were talking about how they were trying to emulate this other YouTube channel that had something like 20 million views over the past three years. I was like, okay, that's great. But let's look at what industry this YouTube channel is in. And let's look at what their cost per thousand views is or what their their revenue per thousand views is. And we figured we were able to back in the numbers and figure out that this YouTube channel has probably made somewhere in the realm of $15,000 over three years, which is $5,000 a year, which is, I mean, and you tell me somebody who can live off $5,000 a year. That's just not a viable business model. And he's like, wow, this is eye-opening. I'm like, yeah, that's, you have to look at it that way. So again, when you're looking at 10,000 over 30 years, I mean, I guess it depends on how many, you know, clients you have scale it becomes a, a volume you have to business. have a ton i mean that's yeah yeah you know, i don't know what that 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 is in terms of revenue per year my math my math is not that good but yeah i i mean you don't need a bucks. ton you don't you don't need a ton i mean you yeah. you could you could do well with you know I, I don't have this many yet but if i was just <clears> targeting the 20 dollars a month subscriber which i'm not I mean, you get 300 of those and they're buying some stuff from you they're you know you're doing some flat fee work for them every month you're good. No, and you're right. And and I so I guess where I'm coming from with that, and it could be different, your business model in two years, you may have already determined is different than this. But I know that a lot there's a lot of subscriptions. I mean, some like an Amazon, you know, they charge you what are they what do they charge now for Amazon Prime? Like 80 bucks, 100 bucks. I don't know what it I is. I think they might up to, they might be up to 150. 150. So 150 a, a year. So which is obviously less than $20 a month. I know, I know, I think. Because we were trying to, we've been waiting. Nine. When 179. We, 179. When we moved back to the States, they would not allow me to, my wife set up an Amazon Prime and I wanted to have my own Amazon Prime account because um, I don't like going into hers and dealing with that. I just like having my own account. So I'm paying $16 a month right now. But after six months, they will allow me to join hers again. So I've just been paying monthly. So it's like $16 a month. So obviously less than yours. I guess my, where I'm going with this is with, over the 30 year time horizon, you know, most subscriptions, people will tend to fall off. Churn is somewhere around, you know, eight, nine, 10 months, maybe a year. And maybe you found that with what you're doing, it's a lot longer than that. I, I mean, but, you know, the question is at some point you're going to figure out there's an average amount of time that somebody's going to stay with you. Is it, I'd say, I suspect 30 years is way too long. Do you know why I pick 30 I, years though? The reason, that? I pick 30, the reason I pick 30 years is because I don't imagine practicing law longer than 30 years from now. So for me, that's my time horizon. Now, yeah. will, will I have built out a firm? Will I have a sellable asset? Will I have a few employees maybe by then because I'm preparing to sell the firm and to sell the practice? Yes. So I will sell or be acquired or something might happen in that interim. But for me practicing, that's why I've picked the 30 year time horizon. I'm 35 right now. I'll be 65 in 30 years. Now, I actually might want to practice law longer than that, especially if it looks differently than it looks right now. But the way I'm practicing law right now, I happen to really enjoy. Yeah. But it might look totally different from now. But that's just like an like if I were to retire right at 65, which that also might not be the retirement age 30 years from now, right? And, and it's a very rough estimate. But that's why I pick 30 years. Let's say I retire at 65. What's the lifetime value for a client for me for the lifetime that I will be practicing law? That's how I'm defining lifetime yeah. value for a professional services business. 
Yeah. And so I guess, I guess it'll be interesting to see, you know, you've been doing this for two years in three more years, you'll start to see like, what is the average? And I'm sure this is something you track on your spreadsheet. What is the average amount of time that somebody stays a client? You know, is it? I have very low churn. I've got like 10% churn, Jim. That's high. You think so? Yeah. You think 10% churn is high for professional I think 10% services? 10% churn is high. I think for subscription businesses that are successful long term, they're in the three to five percent. Yeah, but five, I'm also not a so I'm long. not a software company. I know, I know, I, it, it, which is even worse. I would argue yeah. because that's, software that's why is a sticky. worse worse churn is acceptable because it's People worse. People hate being lawyers. <laughs> that's my my point. No, and so I mean, I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to like, I'm not trying. I hope it doesn't come off this way because I'm certainly no. not trying to like. I think what you're doing is amazing, and I'm. I'm only challenging you because that's what I do with a lot of my clients. They they call me, they want coaching, they want me to help them through their, their issues and problems. You didn't ask for any of that. So I'm probably trying to MacGyver something. I don't need to MacGyver. So I apologize for that. No, no, um, no. No, this I'm is good. This falls with, into the subscription therapy potential branch of law subscribe for sure. Well, no. So what, what will happen is a 10% subscriber, at some point, you'll get to a point where 10%, you need to somehow replace those ten percent of subscribers every month. Why? Why? It only cost me six thousand one hundred dollars to operate my business. No, because your business will start to deteriorate. Because I am. I am. I, I get. I, you know. I get. I get maybe three to five new subscribers every month right now. Okay. No. And that. That's. I'm, I get. I get what you're saying. But here's what I'm saying: is if you look at the numbers on a, is it macro level, like. And I'm not talking about your business. I'm just talking about a subscription business in general. Yeah. Right. Once you reach a certain point, if you're at a 10% churn rate, you're, you're, you, you will have to add more clients to maintain the same level. Or your, I, your I think, business will start to go down. Yeah. I think from a That's macro level, I think from a macro level, you're right. I think from because I operate such a small practice. I think that churn rate may eventually disappear entirely because I'll be I'll reach a saturation where I'm going to stop marketing at all or even I might even start just referring clients out. This is the point where I'm going to need to decide do I hire or do I just re start referring cases out because I anticipate getting just the right amount of clients where I could sustain my lifestyle and stop. And and so I I actually am probably anticipating within the next 5 years, I don't know, it might happen sooner. Um, where I will just reach the income that I think I can achieve and keep a solo practice, a solo practice. Yeah. Which I, which right now I estimate it being about half a million dollars. And I don't think, I think it'll take me another th probably three to five years to get to that level at my current trajectory. And once I hit that, and I'll probably have to outsource some things, but I won't have to hire full time. Once I hit that, I think I'm good. And I'll still keep a little bit of a marketing funnel going because you never know. Clients will, businesses fail, you know, things happen that are completely outside of my control. But I think at that point, I expect to turn to be almost nothing. So that's interesting. And I think probably the number that is affecting this, that so a lot of, let's call them software businesses, call them Amazon, whatever. When you're talking about churn rate, they're they're assuming that based on the the value of the subscription alone, but with you, if what's happening is that you're actually at, actually the lifetime value of that customer is much more than twenty dollars a month. Let's say their value is, you know, fifty dollars a month or a hundred dollars a month or whatever because they hire you for something else. Right. Right. That adds to it. But what I, what I'm saying is so like at a, at a half a million if if we were assuming nothing but subscriptions and nobody was hiring you for anything else, which I think would be You'd be hard pressed to do that. I think that would be, you'd have to be turning clients away. I, I am anticipating moving a lot of the $20 a month subscribers to from a la carte, $20 a month, Costco like pricing yeah. to a all you could eat higher monthly subscription. And that's where I'm going to find the saturation. So eventually I will move to pure subscriptions because it's easier for everybody to manage. Yeah. So that is, I think, the ultimate play. And by then, I hope to have through like, hiring freelance lawyers and through subscription seminar have trained up another other lawyers that are still offering the $20 a month type services yeah. that I could then just refer those clients to those firms who will be handling that. Like I am not trying to grow the next biggest, largest firm. 
I'm yeah. just trying to build a sustainable business for myself. And the sure. more clients I can move, like the, probably, like if, if my goals are accomplished, there will be no client paying me less than $1,000 a month eventually, yeah. right? But but I'm not, I'm not actively trying to pursue that mm-hmm. because I want to see where is the most, like like where am I able to provide the most value and get the most subscribers? Like if I just had, you know, my small business or my business level subscriptions, 2,500 a month, I don't need a lot of those clients to hit my 500, you know, a year annual revenue goals, right? You don't need a lot of those. Yeah, that's yeah, different. yeah. So I would need, yeah, so, so my 2,500 a month, right? Times 12 is 30,000. Right. So then 500. Yeah, you need about 17. Right. Right. So that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, yeah. if I, I could probably do the work for 15 to 20 businesses at that subscription level and not even need to hire. So like, you, you know, it's one of those things where I could just start targeting those types of clients, but it's not necessarily mission aligned. Yeah. And they are, those, exactly. they are late in legal markets, right? Right. Like th- those sure. are small businesses that would go, that have gone long unserved with getting the legal help that they need. So it's still, there's still some mission alignment there, but, but I also, I'm not then helping the next entrepreneur start that business that could get to that level. And I want to do that too. So it's complicated. No. Yeah. And that makes a lot more sense. I, where, where I was going is I was looking at, okay, if you're charging $20 a month, you need 2000 clients, but when you get to that, so if you've got 50 clients and you only have to add at a 10% churn rate, and you only have to add three to five new clients a month, and you're maintaining the same. But if you're at, you have 2000 clients, and you're losing 200 a month, you're going to start to cannibalize your business. And and it's going to start to go down because you're not going to be able to continue adding. That's where I was going. Yeah, Yeah. obviously. Yeah, you're you're right. You're you're absolutely right. Just the business model is just a little bit more nuanced because some of those twenty dollars a month subscribers are converting to paying me more per month. Yeah, yeah, that makes Um, sense. Which is harder to manage, by the way. So if like if I decide to publish this as an episode and how much of this I actually let in, uh, (laughs) it is like then it's much easier to just have like one business model. I have three business models in my practice. Right. And, and it's harder to manage. And could I be more oh. successful if I just had one? Maybe. But, you know, like it's it's complicated. No. Well, that's the same thing we've got. We've got we've got three segments. We've got the the monthly subscribers that are paying one hundred to three hundred dollars a month. We've got the trademark clients who are paying flat fees. And we've got the I'll call them project based clients who pay me on a project basis or point system or whatever you want to call it. And those those people that are at the project level obviously that's that drives a lot of revenue for the firm even if we have one or two clients of those at a time because it's not it's good work right Right. they pay me a fee the project gets done within like a month or two and then it's done versus the trademark they hire me and they're with me for two years regardless of how much they pay us and then the other ones are just kind of there and we do calls when we need to and help them out with stuff when we need to but what i've been struggling with is the client avatar and this is a whole nother topic, whole nother discussion, but um, trying to figure out, am I dealing with three different avatars or am I dealing with one avatar at three different cycles of their business? That's been, that's been, a, that's a struggle I'm having right now, trying to figure yeah. that out. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I'm in the same boat and I do think that one avatar can become another avatar mm-hmm. and you have to have that flexible mindset and not a lot of the coaching that you'll get as a, as a business, let alone a lawyer having customer avatars, right? Is like, this is your avatar and they never change. A- and it is simpler to think about it that way. I just don't think it's realistic. I think the real world is far more nuanced and complicated. I have, I have an episode coming out in three weeks from now. Mm-hmm. It's with Sean Hardeen. And he's, a, he's like the yellow penguin guy, I think is what he's, what is, or something like that. And he, what he does for his coaching, because he's a former solicitor, he's in, I can't remember if he's in the UK or Australia, but he, he helps lawyers value price their services, mostly on a project basis. And I actually just used one of his strategies that he talked about on the podcast, which is you give clients an option. You give them like good, better, best pricing or just better, best pricing for an offering on a project basis, not necessarily on a subscription where it's like, do you want this sooner? you're going to pay a premium 
or mm-hmm. do you want this? Do you do I have more time to deliver this project to you? You're going to pay less. And then if I could have even more time, you're going to pay even less, right? So um, something my coach has had us doing or wants me to do, and it's an assignment that I have to work on in the next two weeks, is they, well, not two weeks, two months, they want us to, and we started plotting this out in Clio. So Clio allows you to like track different activities, right, in the billing system. And so when a client hires us, They pay us a flat fee and then we can track, we still track all our time in Clio and all mark it all as non-billable. And the idea being that we're trying to figure out how much time things are actually taking us so that we can build in that profit margin and still make sure we're charging an appropriate fee. And and so we've been starting to track that for all of our clients. So at, at various stages of the business, we'll do a look back and say, okay, well, how much how much did this cost us to deliver this? And then once we get to the next stage, okay, how much does it cost us to deliver that so far? And then we kind of are going to try and average that out among clients and figure out, well, are we undercharging? Are we overcharging? Like, what are we doing here? That's kind of what we're working on. And the, the ultimate goal with that is to get pretty granular in terms of the activities we're doing, because I did hire a legal assistant in December and, and see now we can start to figure out what my capacity is as an attorney what, how much work I can actually do on like a weekly, monthly basis. So, so then, I, I have a clarification question. That is you're tracking your time to see how long things are taking against a billable rate that you're not actually billing to see if the price that you're charging is the right price to charge in a flat rate? No, we're tracking our time. So if Clio, you've not, you don't use Clio. No. So Clio allows you to pull up the activities and activities are just another way to say time slips, different things or billing entries. And so you can, it's got two columns, billable, non-billable. And so what I can see is I can say, okay, I charged a client X amount of money for this activity, but then I can see, okay, well, here's all the things I did that I'm not billing the client for because it's non-billable because they've char- they paid me a flat fee. And I can say that those, those activities theoretically should come up to, you know, a certain percentage of the flat rate to build in a profit margin as well. And we have goals for what we want to hit for that. And so, so we're, we're basically seeing, okay, so if, if we add up all the non-billables and it actually took us two X time of X being the flat rate that we charge the client, then we know going forward that we're probably undercharging our services, but if it took us and, and, and we're looking at this I, on a, I, again, I, a macro level with yeah. lots of clients, averaging the numbers, that type of thing. So I, I disagree. And here's why. Okay. That's still time equals money mindset. My recommendation would be, instead of looking at it and saying, how should I charge more? I would say, how can I spend less time and do fewer activities and charge the same amount? Because the client's obviously willing to pay it. I want to spend less time on it. Oh. So let's let's remove the impediments. And maybe you could increase prices a little bit, but I would find a way to just spend less time and then get more clients at that price point. Okay. No, I, I agree with that. And I'm not... You, you're You're... I, it sounds to me like you're making what I heard you say was you're making the assumption that we're doing this as a way to see if we can charge more. That's not actually the case. We're doing this to just see, are we charging appropriately? And, you know, so if it comes back that like we charge somebody a thousand dollars for something and we do all track all the time, it only takes us $250 and we're like, okay, Hey, this is, we're charging. We've made That's a time equals money. profit. That's great. That's time equals money though. But, but we've already, but we're still building in ways to save money. So if we don't, time always equals money, whether no, you- No, no, no. The reverse is true. The reverse is true. Time equals freedom. And the last time I could spend on, like the value of the work is not time equals money. The value of the work is how much is somebody willing to pay for this thing? That's it. And, and that value uh, yeah. could go, that, that value could be the same amount, regardless of how much time is spent, whether it's one minute or a hundred hours. And so time doesn't equal money. That's a fiction that we've just made up. And so I, I just have a completely different philosophical approach to it, which is track your time only in that you know how, what you're spending your time on and figure out how could you spend less time doing that thing. Oh, and that's the I only agree reason that. I would say track your time. I would not say it took two hours. That's $250 because that's time equals money. It's that took two hours. Can we make it one hour? Okay, we made it one hour. Can we make it 30 minutes? And if you even if you do think time equals money, your billable rate just goes up when you do that. If you have to think about time equals money, 
Mm -hmm. But but now you're just thinking about terms of productization, automation, same value. Now you could still charge more because if that task is worth more to what the client is willing to pay, that's the only thing, that's the only way you could assess value. And I think you, I see you're agreeing with well, me is like, what, how much I, is the I client willing to pay? You. Yeah. I do agree with you in probably 90% of the way. Yeah. Uh, but, but so the, the, the point of this exercise really, so the, the, the determining whether or not we're charging an appropriate amount is one thing. And, and, and I should also mention, like, there's things I've been charging for, for years and years and years that I'm probably not going to change because I've already honed those systems in and I've, I've made them as efficient as I can. But like, for example, I helped a client uh, close the sale of a business last week in Florida. And I looked at how I did that. And I, I, I can also do a debrief and say, okay, you know, what did we do? How would, did we charge appropriately for this? You know, were there ways that we could have been more efficient? Can we build systems that are going to make us more efficient in the future so that we can increase our profit margin if we were to charge the same amount for the next client? Right. And and so that that's one part of the analysis. The other part of the analysis is kind of something I said a minute ago, but I think it kind of got glossed over, which is what's my capacity? Because, you know, you and I know we can only do so much. You can only do if one part of your subscription is I'm going to do calls with clients. Well, you can only do you know, X number of clients calls a week because you're doing podcasts, because you have legal work to do. You have all these things that you need to do. So I need to figure out how many, you know, let's call it trademarks, let's call it projects, let's call it client calls, whatever. How much of that can I do on a weekly, daily, monthly basis? And so when I start to bump up against, I'm, I'm running, I have too much. I'm not, a, I'm at, I'm over capacity. It helps us to decide, do we need to hire somebody to help with that work now too? So there's other, there's a lot of reasons why we do that. It's not all related to pricing. It's also related to capacity issues and things like that as well. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, how I would answer that capacity thing is I would start to, instead of just letting clients schedule calls with me, I would do standing meetings. I would, I would pivot. So it's not necessarily about a capacity thing. It's about a systems thing. And what I like about being a solo is I can just pivot my SOPs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course just, you can. Just completely cannibalize the old system for a brand new one if I run into capacity problems. Like that's that would be my pivot. I'm not there yet. I've only been in business for two years. And I've got 30 something clients, you know. So, you know, I'm in a good place in terms of capacity. But I think if I was hitting capacity problems, yeah, I would just be like, I would just block off, here's the time of day that I meet with clients and I've just set up standing meetings with clients every week and have weekly check-ins for 15 minutes with every single client. And they could waive it if they wanted to, but like that's that would be my pivot if I started to run into capacity issues, which but I think I actually might be more ethical because I'm definitely meeting with a client every week as opposed to, you know, maybe they meet with me, maybe they don't. And we have to worry about the legal ethics and the earned fee of it all. Okay. But what happens when you have too many clients to fit in those blocks? then I either increase my prices or stop marketing or hire, or, you know, you do the other things. But, okay. but the increase in your prices does not align with your vision of what you want your firm to do. I would increase my prices in that I would start to pivot to the higher tiered subscriptions that I'm already offering for the latent legal market that I will continue to serve in that particular yeah. segment of the market. Yeah. So I wouldn't necessarily increase my prices. I would, I would maybe turn off my $20 a month subscription, $100 a month subscriptions. And I okay. would just start to, and I would continue to service those clients as long as they wanted to stay subscribed. Yep. But then I would just pivot to just the other segments of the late legal market that I'm also serving, which would be a shame. But also the goal is also in terms of firm goals, profitability goals that I do want to hit while continuing to do the best to serve the mission. It would just, you know, I, I'd be, I'd be over that like 250,000 annual revenue hump. And then I think I'd probably start to have to do that stuff. You know what you should do is you should start a nonprofit and then you should go get money from people and you should just, you know, it just sounds like, I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. This is why I'm but, training other lawyers to do it. This is why I have the podcast because yeah. other lawyers will come in the space and serve that market. And and it, it's a fiction to say that like I could always run a law firm and hire lawyers that are just worker bees and run it that way and be CEO lawyer because eventually – if you're embodying what all lawyers should eventually do, your worker bees will want to go do their own thing anyway. So I've just said, screw it. I'm just going to be a solo and just inspire other attorneys or teach other attorneys how to do that stuff. And then as they grow and develop in their practice, 
new attorneys that come in through the pipeline will come in with cheaper prices and all that stuff. So yeah. that's a goal anyway. So you're going to be a solo forever. That is, that's the current path I'm on. I'm very open to other opportunities. <laughs> it depends though. It definitely depends. It to be seen. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like if th there are a couple of clients I have right now that if they were like, um, we like your work so much, we just want to bring you in house full time. I would seriously consider it. And then I'd have to like sell my practice probably. Yeah. 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 Well, so you hey, never know. Be a, that'd be a good problem to have potentially. And that's our show. Thanks again to 650 and Gavel for being sponsors. The best way for others to discover this show is for you to share it with somebody you think would find value from it. Follow me on LinkedIn since that's where I'm most active on social media and click the bell towards the top right of my profile to get notified about all of my posts about this podcast and everything else I think is valuable for you to see. To get in touch, message me on LinkedIn or email kerbis at lawsubscribed.com. All links are in the show notes. Until next time, this is Matthew Kerbis with Law Subscribed. Subscribed.